from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased joining me, Miguel Serenas. Miguel, thank you very much for being with me on the show today. The way I love to do it, as all my guests know by now, is I keep it to my guests to introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit more about your background, your journey, and what you're currently up to. So the floor is yours. Hey, thanks for having me. So I'm Miguel. I'm a third time Bootstrap founder. I uh, recently just sold my AI company, uh, Journey Plus um, Web Interface for Mid Journey. And I'm building a new product. It's called One Price, uh, AB, a way to AB test your pricing. Um, and I'm also been investing a lot more in a personal brand. So if you, uh, I'll t- talk to Mehmet, but uh, I've been creating a lot more content around the startup journey and entrepreneurship on short form videos. So TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. Cool. And thank you again for being here with me t- today, uh, Miguel. It would be like a really exciting discussion. I can feel it from the beginning. So, um, you know, you sold your AI startup just three months after launch. Like this is way, way, way faster than what you usually see, right? So what do you think what, were the key moves or let's say the strategies that made that possible? Good question. I, I think the main strategy was going bootstrap. So I think when you're going fully bootstrap, you're a lot more flexible with how you want to take the direction of your company. And we kind of got this opportunity to sell uh, at the right time where we're, it was going really well, but also we wanted to see where we can explore other ideas uh, from this product. So we decided to sell. Uh, so we sold a private equity three months after launching and there was like a good amount of alignment between both parties. So that's kind of why we decided to sell. That's cool. Now, one thing usually, and when I talk to entrepreneurs like yourself, Miguel, is what worked well with you, especially when, when it comes to validating the idea, right? So especially when we talk about anything today, SaaS, AI, you know, um, validation is key. So. Any specific, you know, steps or maybe work book or let's say uh, method that you find it useful to validate and be able to onboard customers fast? I think early on what really worked for us was social media. So usually the way uh, when you like write tweets or put any content on like what you're building, you can kind of see how tuned your audience is into it and like how receptive they are to the idea. So that's kind of how we started. Um, and I think like a lot more people should be going organic. So I know some people like start with the paid ads, but I think everyone should start organic since you get a lot better data from your customers. You get a lot better feedback from what are you, you've been getting with organic. That's super cool to know, you know, like it's, it's a, it's a good one to do. Now you, you're speaking a lot about content creation and, you know, personal branding and honestly, um, my point of view, you know, especially in these days is that as everything is changing, technology is changing, we are changing and reaching, you know, customers or even keep reaching people, you know, is, is also changing, right? So, um, you kind of mastered this content creation, community building in, in the tech world. So, um, the, my first question, let's, let's, just, you know, mm-hmm. focus a bit on this area. So the first thing, some some of the founders that or some of the people that I used to speak to, they said, look, we, we understand what you're coming from, but, you know, being in front of the camera or like, let's say, um, you know, writing content or, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's working. It's like not us, you know, like we, we feel like we are these geeky people, you know, that we should be coding or we should be doing this. So... 
why do you think, or do you agree with me that they need to do kind of a shift in their mindset so they really put time on their personal brand so they can stand out online? Do you, do you agree with me, Miguel, on this? Yeah, so this is the next vision for myself, like in my founder journey. So personal branding, this is going to be like a multi-year long journey I'm going to invest into. Yeah, I think more people should be doing this. Like the thing is building is good. Like with AI, building and coding is a lot easier than what it is. So you need to be the next skill set that's going to be really important these next five, 10 years is going to be like grabbing attention. So building the founder brand, making content, because the thing is with personal branding is this branding sticks with you throughout your life. So any project you do, whatever endeavor you want to try to do, it can be amplified with your personal branding. Um, and for me, like when I first started writing on Twitter, I'm now in this like indie hacker community that's helped me a lot with like partnerships, uh, collaborations that help like uh, boost my products. But now I'm doing a bit more of the short form video since I think, especially for consumer, it's very important for you to be on video because that's where everyone is consuming. Um, so if you want, like, especially if you have a mobile app, for example, I've been seeing a lot of people make a lot more videos and getting a lot of traction much quicker than you would specifically without, uh, with personal branding per se. That's super cool. Good, good enough. Good to know. Um, so, so for you, you use Twitter and, uh, you know, I know like you run your newsletter. Um, yeah. so let me ask you this. How, how do you make sure you're keeping, you know, you, you, you're getting like new things every time you share something. I mean, because of course there are some kind of content and I think you'd agree with me, Miguel, which is like what we call mm -hmm. it evergreen. So even if I, let's say this podcast is an evergreen thing because, you know, we, we might come to it like later and then people will find and, you know, the, some of the information would still relevant, but in, in the founder journey and because, you know, they're doing things, especially if they are, for example, building in public, which we started to see a lot of people also doing as well. So what is the, um, I would say, strategy, let's call it, to keep the content fresh, to keep coming with new ideas and not sound like as if you are repeating yourself? Because see, I know like some people, they talk about repurposing and then you bring something old and then you bring it again. But, you know, the audience, you know, and people are becoming more and more smarter and they can differentiate, you know, how people, they are acting online, whether it's written, video, audio, whatever it is. So how we keep, how we can keep the content fresh and relevant to the audience in your opinion, of course. Yeah, I think, well, the thing that's awesome about content is the depth that you can go to. So specifically on Twitter or short form video, it's very short, very surface level, but on platforms like YouTube or like a podcast, for example, you can go a lot deeper. And so there's different type of formats you can play with in terms of depth, like how, how long you want to go into. Uh, so it can provide a lot more value. But also I think for me, my process for kind of keeping up with ideas is I kind of just look at what I've been doing um, in my daily life and kind of just reframing it in a way that's very valuable to the people I'm speaking to. So I think that's like the main thing. Um, and that kind of keeps it coming fresh because usually it's I think it's like what you think you know, like really a lot of people don't don't know. Like sometimes, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is like the things you've learned, you've already learned. Some people maybe on a different pathway in the journey, like much earlier. And so this information might have been very useful to them, like early on, like when you're way early on in the journey, like just starting out, for example. That's cool. Now let me ask you also one thing, Miguel. Like Sometimes founders will be working on something which is obvious, mainly a problem which everyone has it, you know, everyone knows about it. So making content around it, especially if it's a SaaS product, it's easy. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're solving really a problem, but you're taking a kind of a different approach. And now you want to make it digestible, let's say, to, to, the, to the audience. So what are like some of the tricks that, that we can do so to make it, understandable by everyone that can watch or like read our content. Mm, sorry, can you rephrase that again? So what I was saying, um, yeah. Miguel, so sometimes we are, we're, we're, we're building a, a product, whether B2B, mm -hmm. B2C doesn't matter, which is like very obvious, right? So the concept yeah. and you know, the way that they're going to use it and you know, the way they're going to uh, interact with it, it's easy, super easy. So it's easy also to create content around it, but sometimes we need to go and 
explain something which is a little bit like more complex, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Especially in the SaaS, right? So how we can yeah. make it more digestible for the general audience? So is there any any process for that? Mm -hmm. I, I think specifically for my content, I try to keep the language super simple. So any type of jargon, um, especially in like the tech world, there's a lot of jargon. So I try and break down the jargon to like much simpler terms as I can. So it's a bit more mass appealing. Uh, I, th I think there's definitely like a challenge since like the, the stuff we work with is very confusing, very high tech and like the general person won't be able to uh, understand it. But I think just very keeping simple with your language. So when it comes to my writing specifically, I try and keep it under like grade four, grade three level, like extremely simple. So like almost like everyone can understand it basically. Got it. And yeah, this is exactly, uh, Miguel, what I was, you know, the, the answer I was uh, waiting from you is not to use jargons and, you know, like make it more uh, understandable to, to, to the folks who would be, um, you know, watching, listening, whatever. Um, so from, from, you know, the, another perspective, which I want to ask you also as well, which is mainly about uh, the community building, right? So of course you, you establish a brand and, the, I believe the next uh, natural step is to start building communities, right? So mm -hmm. now walk me through, and this is because, you know, a lot of founders, they wonder about this. And I think, you know, what you are doing in this space is really important, uh, Miguel. Uh, so, so because we are just kind of putting the roadmap for them to, to reach when, where they want to reach. So how do you start building a community? And what are like some of the things you should do building the community? Is it like a hosting events? Is it like, I don't know, uh, do like gatherings? So what have you seen working in, in, in that space? Hmm. I, I think specifically here, so I'm based here in New York. Uh, so hosting events is very big here. So I've seen series of events uh, being hosted here all the time. And I think that's a very great, uh, very intimate way for community building. But if you want to take it di digital, I think having like, a community like online, for example, on Discord, uh, where you'd be hosting workshops and webinars would also be really helpful if you don't have that, if you don't live in a specific place where you can build that community like in real life. Got you. It's, uh, you know, uh, great, uh, great answer, Miguel, again. And uh, yeah, so, so I agree with you. Now, um, if if we want to like for example give some advice to founders who are looking to host their tech or SaaS focus event, uh, so or if they are like new to the to the community building, so like what tips or hints you can you can give them, uh, Miguel? So I think especially studying on community building, I think people just overthink it a lot. So how I started was. Literally my first event, I just picked like a bar nearby me. So I just like walked into multiple venues, asked if I could host something. And usually you can get a pretty good deal if, um, if they're like a bar that's, or like an establishment that doesn't get as much foot traffic. So from that, I was able to get a free venue. And then from Tech Week, New York Tech Week, I was able to get 500 signups. And I, I had around 250 people come to my event. Uh, so honestly, I think just keeping it simple at first is very important. So you can kind of figure out the logistics of hosting an event um like getting signups and all of that stuff but i think like mainly what's important is putting a lot more into the marketing than like actually like sourcing the venue and all of that perfect now i want to go back to you know um, the social presence and i know you mm. mostly you like x or what used to be known as twitter um so why you know you prefer X or Twitter uh, as a place to to be in, um, like more than other social media platforms. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, yeah, X is awesome. I mean, the community there is much more vibrant and friendly, and it's very relevant to what I'm doing. So, for example, I'm very deep in the indie hacker community space, and then the community there is just awesome. Everyone's super helpful. Um, there's a lot of like knowledge that they share online, and they're very public about what they've been doing. So, I think that's really why I like like Twitter the most. Um, it's been great. I've been, in, I'm now in like multiple like Discord communities of like super great communities just from Twitter. So it's great, great um, opportunity just being on that platform. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I'm <laughs> I'm not by any mean, you know, an indie hacker or something like this. But you know, one of the things that um, I uh, noticed also as well is that like people they like to help each others a lot there, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so yeah, that's yeah. one thing that I noticed. Um, talking about you know indie hacking and about you know solopreneurship and all this. Um, What's your take about the future of, you know, startup founders? Are we going to see like more indie hackers? Are we going at some stage, go back to the, you know, what we used to say before, like decades ago, people go to the garage with a co-founder and start things and bring it up. Like what's, what's your, your vision on, on, on that? Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. So with AI, it's just going to be so much easier to do more with less. So like solopreneurship or maybe like t teams of three to five people, it's much easier to build a bigger company than what was possible before because AI can like automate so much more stuff and like automate away all the annoying tidbits you don't really want to do and just generate a lot more value overall with the amount of time that you have. So I, I think in the future, we're going to see a lot more smaller scale, um, more nimble startups and so maybe like between five to 10 people going after like much bigger problems than what um, what was possible before? Yeah, that's that's a um, you know point of view. I would say um, within that space, uh, Miguel. Like um, I know also like founders nowadays that uh, you know they need they need not only to find you know a product that people would want. They need also something that. Uh, you know, they can validate quickly. And we just talked about the validation like a few moments ago. Uh, here, I want to ask you about something because maybe I have missed to ask you before. Oh, in the validation, you know, the, the landing page is something very important. And I know like you've reviewed over 300 landing pages. Um, what are the mistakes usually you've seen people doing? And what are the things that they should avoid so they have high conversion ratios from, from these landing pages? Yeah, so I think one main thing, if you're not really used to building a landing page, I would just stick with the template. Because I think if you stick with a custom built landing page, it's very easy to mess up the design and kind of screw up the flow of the landing page. So I would use something like Framer and use some of their templates, uh, very simple, very good looking templates. But I think in terms of like conversion rate, the thing people mess up most on is the headline and sub headline. So they don't really craft the message to their customers as well. Uh, cause the thing is people think you can really only have one landing page, but really you can have multiple, like, for example, you can have a landing page for one specific niche. Like for example, if I'm targeting SaaS, I can have a landing page for SaaS people, and then I can have a landing page for e-commerce people. So you can have multiple versions of the landing page and redirect people, uh, the specific landing page you want. So it can very, be very, very specific with your messaging, which helps a lot with conversion rate. So I, I'd, I'd highly recommend that's kind of like a small hack I've learned. Okay. And, you know, and keep it simple, right, uh, Miguel? Like they, they don't, they don't need to exaggerate in the design. So, because I've seen like people, they spend more time on just the designs and, you know, the uh, cosmetics and aesthetics side of it more than actually, you know, delivering the message. I mean, am I missing something or do you agree with me on that? Yeah. I think people love to like make it super calm, like make it super pretty at first, but that unfortunately doesn't really convert as much as you think it would. Yeah, because, you know, I, I, and this is what I tell people when I meet them, I said, like, guys, focus on, on something that works. Believe it or not, if you really are solving a problem and you deliver the message in, in your landing pages, like, you're going to go for it. Of course, I'm not saying, like, keep it ugly, but, I mean, spend time first on, on that and then let's, let's, let's take it later. Um, we share something in, in common, uh, Miguel. <laughs> and let me ask you about it. So you are an advocate of being a generalist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how that gave you an edge in your career? Yeah, I think being, being a generalist is super fun. So like I think in the past like six to nine months, what I've learned is like SEO uh, content, uh, landing pages, um, hosting events and community building. So I think that's, the surface area of what I've learned in the past year. Um, I, I think it's like, if you can really do a lot of stuff, 
can move your company and your products forward and really not get stuck as much as someone who only knows one or two things, you know? So like right now for me, like before I was like very deep into engineering, but now I'm focused a lot more on growth, growth marketing. Um, and that's been also really fun, really enjoyed. So it's like a, a very fresh take on like new stuff I can learn, like new things I can be obsessed about, but also this can help me move forward with a business at the same time. It's a very deadly combination. So if I can like build and sell, uh, like Naval says, it's very, it's very great uh, skill set. And I think this, and this is my two cents on this. Being a generalist, to you know, to add to what you said, so when things change fast, you'd be able to unlearn the things that doesn't, you know, matter anymore, or like they become kind of obsolete, and then start to learn, you know, whatever is in you. So this is why I'm I'm big advocate also of uh, of being generalist. I'm not saying like it's wrong to be specialist. That there are super smart people who are specialists and I really admire, you know, the work they do, but at least for me, this is what have worked. And, you know, I believe the future is for generalists more than, uh, uh, specialists. Uh, funny enough, a couple of, of weeks ago, I just shared, like, it seems we are going back in time because if you look at the, the old Greek civilization, the Romans, so you see this guy who's a philosopher you know, scientist, uh, you know, he knows biology, math, you know, he knows all these things and they write books about all these topics. So, you know, and, and they are the super smart people and, you know, in the modern area also like uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So yeah, this is why I'm a big fan of, of being journalist. Now, one, one term uh, I know also, you know, when I was preparing for, for the episode today, Miguel, um, you talk about it is the second brain, right? And we always hear, you know, this term second brain, right? So uh, tell me a little bit more about your own way. Is it like, what is it? And how do you manage that second brain and, you know, be able to, again, because you are a generalist, be able to go across all the things that you do, which being founder, creator, community host, and so on. Yeah, I think honestly, my second brain like amplifies all my skill sets as a generalist. Um, so I use Obsidian and then I have this literal Wikipedia of knowledge from everything I've learned from each skill in Obsidian. So it, they're just like a bunch of markdown notes, but they're all linked together and all very organized. So if I ever forget to do something, I'll just pull up my notes and it's very powerful. I think like I think everyone should be doing this because I, I think especially if you're a person that wants to be more entrepreneurial, you need to be learning a lot of skill sets and there's a lot of context and like nuance in each specific skill. So I write down a lot of notes and those, a lot of notes help me keep context of all of it. And it's basically like, if you, if you steal my second brain, it's, you'll be like, you'll have superpowers in each specific skill. Cause like I have all my playbooks down in there. Like everything I do, it's written down. Everything is on there. So honestly, it's a massive, massive life hack. Cause especially with like nowadays, there's like so much knowledge out there that's scattered and you need a way to kind of distill it and put it all in one place. And that's going to be your second brain. Cool. Some people use Notion, right? So Notion is also another great tool, I believe, for, for using that. Am I mm -hmm. correct or wrong? <laughs> yeah, I think Notion is also very popular. Um, and I think like something like Reflect Notes, I think. But personally, I like Obsidian because it's very fast. It's local first. Uh, it's local. Then, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's like VS code where it's very extensible and I, I really like the extensibility. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have, you know, I, I tried it once. I didn't continue, um, uh, because I was lazy to migrate everything I have in notion to there. <laughs> so everything stayed there, but yeah, I like the fact that, you know, I can access it also on my own machine, even if they, if I don't have internet and, you know, it's just local and so on so absolutely now we're gonna do a couple of very quick questions before we, we wrap up this uh, with you uh, Miguel today um, majority of people like yourself usually you would find them in uh, the west coast in the bay area but you selected to be in New York why I, I just really like New York in terms of the diversity of the culture here I, I think specifically um, especially as they're working on different problems the problems really you're exposed to kind of help um, direct the direction of your startup. So like, for example, if I want to delve a deep, uh, bit deeper into like a fashion startup, for example, I could, there's a big fashion scene here. I can really just like talk to a lot of people in this space. And then 
I don't know, there's just so many things you can get exposed to here that you really didn't think was possible or just a very different perspective. So I think that kind of helps me kind of be a bit more creative. And then I think if I didn't really like move here, I wouldn't be a, as much focused on my personal brand because here there's a lot of people that have very, very big personal brands and kind of helps them for their businesses. And so that also like inspires me at the same time. So I think that's kind of why I chose here. Cool. Now I'm gonna, you know, ask you again, name me, you know, three figures in the indie hacker space that, uh, you know, you can get, uh, uh, I would say, you know, you, you, you like, you know, or you admire the, the work they do in, in the indie hacking space, any three names? Yeah. So I think top of mind is Mark Luvian. So the thing is, Mark, you have really good indie hacker, um, really good at building products, but also he's really, really good at content. So he's grown very quickly in YouTube. I think he has like over like a hundred K now, but I think the reason why his businesses are doing well is because he does YouTube really well. Um, so I think like YouTube, like, I, like once I get more time, I think I'll also end up doing YouTube since uh, it's like you get a lot more conversion, uh, from YouTube. Um, so that's the first one. Let's see. I think Peter levels, like he's like the OG. Like India, like he's been there the entire time. He knows he's done it, and then he just keeps doing it again. I think he also a big inspiration for everyone. And I was kind of really happy he was on that podcast with Alex Fredman. That's a very yeah. big win for the community. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And then I think Sandra and Dan from the Morning Maker Show. They're mm -hmm. they've also been doing a lot more content. But I'm in the community, and the community is awesome. I love their community. It's full of great people, and I've been getting a lot of help. I've been giving a lot of help over there. And it's just overall great group to be around. So very happy about it. Absolutely. And finally, uh, which, you know, I, I would not tell you ask books, but I mean, what are, you can choose books, resources that you advise, you know, new founders, tech founders to go and, and, and read or grab. Mm, interesting. I think some of the UX UI design ones are very interesting. So one of them is like, don't make me think. Um, and then there's like a partner book to that called Rocket Surgery and Made Easy. And so it kind of gives you like a really good framework, a very simple framework for deciding like, okay, like how do you want to craft your app? Or it kind of gives you that kind of really good baseline for design that you can really apply like any, any other place, like graphics or landing pages or like um, content. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd really recommend that one, I think. I just finished Zero to Soul uh, by Arvid Call. That one's also really good. Very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. Literally goes over like every single thing you'd uh, stumble upon in the journey of building a bootstrap company. So I also recommend that. Um, and then also, there's also the SaaS playbook on by Rob Walling. That's the one I'm going to read next. So pretty. Also really excited about that. I think that one's also going to be really good. I've heard only good things about it, so. Yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm big fan of Arvid also as well uh, with his podcast, and you know, for me, he he is, and I'm sure he his his uh, new gig will pick up this because we mentioned his name. So, the what I like about his style is he, he kind of he was able to join this mature figure right with yeah. the indie hacking style. So, um, and you know, like he get things into really, really a way that everyone can understand what the guy is, is trying to do. So absolutely, I'm a big fan also as well. Uh, Miguel, as we are coming to an end, any final thoughts any, where, and where people can can get in touch with you? Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter, uh, my first name, last name, Miguel Serenas. And then you can also find me on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube uh, under the same handle. So, and then if you want to read more of my stuff in depth, I also have a newsletter. It's called The Maker's Report. So it's a beehive newsletter, so you can also find it anywhere. Um, and I guess final thoughts, yeah, just, I think just start making videos. I think videos are going to be the next generation of content everyone's going to watch. Everyone, all the platforms are going towards it. So I think if you're to start making content, start making videos. It's also really fun, so. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, Miguel, really, I enjoyed this conversation today, and I'm very happy that... Uh, you you were able to to make it to to be on the show with me today so i really appreciate your time and your uh, thoughts and your, your advice also to the community thank you very much for being with me here today and i'm sure like you know a lot of uh, to be in the hackers or even like tech founders will will benefit out of it and i agree with you on on the 
branding part and, you know, making content, which is video mainly, 100% on this. And this is usually how I end my show. This is for the audience. If you just discovered this podcast by luck, thank you for passing by. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did so, don't forget, give us a thumb up, subscribe and share it with your friends and colleagues. We are available on all podcasting platforms while available in video on YouTube also as well. And if you are one of the people who keeps coming back and listen to us and watch our episodes, thank you very much for doing so. I really appreciate all your feedbacks, questions, and suggestions. Keep them coming. I read them all. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll meet again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button. Share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.